forward. Okay, so welcome to session one. Two papers, both on the theme of um, financial reporting and accounting. Um, the first one is something that carries on from a panel we had last year, um, which is research into the development of international accounting standards, or certainly starting with uh, an accounting standard in, in the UK, and then moving on to a paper that looks at the credit union responses. So, Elizabeth, you're going to share your screen for your uh, presenters to present. Yes. Okay. So think, let me know if you can see. You can see your desktop. We can see your slides now. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. So do you so, want to start, to start? Yeah, I will. I'll put the timer on. I'll tell you when you've had 20 minutes, shall I? Yeah, I think our presentation will be around 25 or so minutes. Okay. And yeah. Away you go. Yeah. Okay. Just let me um, get um, all right. Perfect. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, session. So we're going to take the opportunity and uh, inform you about the project we are currently working on, which is the development of a UK uh, statement of recommended practice or SORP uh, in accounting and uh, reporting uh, for um, cooperatives. Uh, so for those that uh, are not familiar with uh, what uh, SORPs are, SORPs are specific, um, sector specific, guidance on accounting. For example, there is a, a charity SORP and uh, they are uh, found in many uh, different countries. However, currently there are no uh, SORPs or specific accounting standards for cooperatives in uh, the UK. So this project is led by Daphne Rickson, Associate Professor and Executive Director of uh, the Center of Excellence in Accounting and Reporting for Cooperatives, CIRC. Uh, at St. Uh, Mary's uh, University. Uh, Maureen McCulloch, yeah, Senior Lecturer in Accounting uh, at Oxford Brooks uh, Business School. I think you're still affiliated <laughs> Business School, Maureen, and myself, uh, uh, Elisabeth Manzari, a Lecturer in Accounting uh, at Birmingham Business School. So uh, in terms of the uh, layout, I will start by providing briefly uh, the background um, and address briefly what is the issue and why does it matter to have um, accounting for cooperatives and what has been done so far. I will then uh, briefly introduce the UK SORP project and then I will hand over to Maureen to discuss in more detail the specific uh, financial reporting issues that UK uh, SORP um, the, the UK SOAP project will focus and work on. And uh, Daphne will then conclude with a broader discussion on how cooperative reporting could be uh, better aligned and reflect the seven uh, principles, uh, cooperative principles, and the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Okay, so um, one uh, might ask. Um, whether uh, accounting um, or financial reporting are important. And we will argue that even though uh, the role of accounting has been largely overlooked in research uh, and practice, accounting can contribute to uh, aligning more effectively um, the cooperative uh, economic, uh, social and cultural goal. So the formats uh, that are available currently for financial reporting for cooperatives um, are either for profit or private interest or uh, philanthropic uh, public interest, yeah, which ignores the very basis of the cooperative model, yeah, which is uh, the, the mutual interest. So cooperatives kind of sit between organizations that are entirely uh, commercially motivated and those which are entirely for public benefit. Uh, and so accounting formats don't reflect um, 
key uh, values are important values of self-help, participation, and the effect these principles uh, have on, uh, on the wider community. Uh, also, on why it's important, as Daphne will discuss, uh, the available formats we have uh, currently do not really make it possible to, to connect cooperatives uh, use of financial resources uh, to uh, the, the seven cooperative uh, principles and SDGs. Now, why does it matter? So we think that the development of a, of a SORP for cooperatives um, can be very useful uh, in um, contributing to uh, our understanding of uh, whether uh, the definition, uh, the purpose and the principles of uh, cooperatives are being met in uh, different entities. So uh, a SORP could allow uh, the cooperative sector to become more visible and also um, develop a narrative, an accounting narrative that can be more useful to uh, cooperative members and to, to the public. And if we want to take it one step further, uh, developing a, uh, the cooperative mutual uh, model can also kind of present an alternative uh, to the current uh, profit maximization models uh, for businesses. And if properly understood and used by uh, cooperative members and the public, uh, this model uh, can lead the way in using market uh, mechanisms uh, for social and environmental benefit rather than just financial returns. Uh, on uh, what has been done so far, there are actually a number of initiatives over uh, the last de decade or so. So uh, CIRC uh, that was formed in 2007, um, aiming at uh, developing and interpreting uh, accounting uh, policies and standards that um, recognize the, the, the distinctiveness of uh, cooperatives and credit unions. Um, uh, has worked with academics and practitioners to develop uh, an international uh, SORP, uh, the ISORPS. Uh, so back in 2008 or 9, uh, the uh, CIRC uh, former uh, executive director, John Maddox, together with uh, people like um, Alan Robb, uh, Elizabeth Hicks, uh, Tom Webb and Daphne Rickson, uh, developed a series of working papers addressing key uh, components of, uh, of the SORP, and they've also produced discussion papers um, available online for feedback um, and uh, working towards developing a full international SORP. So this is still an ongoing project and um, CERC's International Cooperative uh, SORP Committee continues to work on the project together with um, um, COPS UK. So uh, also more recently, the ICA uh, commissioned uh, Maureen McCulloch to, to write a concept paper. So in this paper, uh, Maureen uh, tried to explore um, the possibility of um, the, the cooperative movement uh, developing a SORP, yeah, using uh, the SORP in uh, accounting and reporting for charities in the UK as uh, an example of how um, a different approach to accounting can be accommodated uh, under IFRS and what the cooperatives can learn from, from uh, uh, the charity SORP. Uh, the, the paper was followed by the uh, adoption uh, in October 2019 um, of a resolution to, uh, to explore the practicalities of international uh, SORP by the ICA. Um, so one of the objectives uh, is to develop a relationship between, um, um, sorry, with um, international standard setters to adopt a cooperative format for financial accounting and reporting and develop uh, related, related standards. So the idea is to approach the, the project at both national and um, international uh, level. So first to develop a UK COP SORP with the aim of incorporating it into the UK legislation. And that is because we have the precedents in the UK, um, we have the charity SORP uh, that um, um, was enacted in law. 
And this is uh, also one of the reasons why the current project we're going to talk about is being pursued in the UK. And then using the UK COP accounting uh, SORP as a base to develop an international uh, COP SORP, uh, like the way in which the charity SORP in the UK was established as uh, an acceptable um, frame uh, under the International Financial Reporting Standards, the uh, IFRS. And finally, in uh, 2020, the ICA uh, issued a survey to all its uh, members on behalf of the CIRC uh, SORP committee to uh, gather evidence on accounting and reporting um, uh, con uh, frameworks um, that are used uh, worldwide. So Daphne can provide some information on the results of the survey. Okay, so a few words uh, about the UK SORP uh, project. So a few months ago, we applied for and we received um, some uh, ESRC funding uh, via the University of uh, Bern Birmingham to work on the UK SORP project. So this is kind of um, um, part of a longer, longer term project to establish UK accounting standards for, uh, for cooperatives. So at the moment, the short term goals um, and actions um, involve um, forming a working group in order to produce some recommendations uh, addressing key accounting issues uh, and components of uh, UK SORP and draft some discussion papers. Uh, we also want to uh, pilot these recommendations uh, through focus groups uh, with practitioners and also uh, using uh, surveys. So overall, what we're trying to achieve um, and what the output of this uh, working group is to hopefully provide uh, the necessary groundwork uh, to meet uh, the criteria that are set by the uh, FRC, the, the Financial Reporting Council, which is the UK accounting regulator, in order to establish um, an authorized SORP and a SORP making body that will be responsible for developing the standards. Um, so the project officially starts this month, but we have already done some preparation meetings and uh, here you can see who is currently uh, involved in the in the sort committee. So I would also like to uh, take the opportunity and uh, invite uh, anyone interested to participate in these uh, focus groups and uh, um, spread the word and um, they can always contact, it, contact us if they're interested in getting involved and we're going to provide uh, our contact details uh, at the end of the presentation. So now uh, I'm going to hand over to Daphne to discuss more specifically about the uh, financial uh, accounting issues that uh, we're planning to work on. Sorry, Maureen, did I say Daphne? Yeah, it's because I'm seeing your <laughs> image. So Maureen. That's great, thank you. Can, can you advance the slides for me, please? Yes. Thank you. So um, we're starting from the um, sort of the premise that a cooperative is not the same as an investor owned business. And um, I thought it was really interesting how Bruno was talking about how um, the definition of the co-op was um, established over uh, so many years and such a lot of discussion in quite a different way from um, the way that the international financial reporting standards decided that um, that financial reporting is for um, mainly for investors. So we've got the definition um, of a co-op, the autonomous association of persons voluntarily um, associating to meet their common economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations. It's so much broader than um, looking at financial um, returns, um, the jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise um, as well. It's principled business doing all sorts of different things. Um, so that co-ops are based on this set of values put into practice um, 
across all sectors practically. Um, there's a particular problem in the UK because um, although um, co-ops are sort of are recognised internationally, we actually don't have a proper legislative definition of them in the UK. Um, and they're free to use any, um, any legal form that they choose or no legal form at all. This makes life quite difficult for co-ops because you can't say, oh, they're regulated by such and such a body and here they are. Um, and it makes it difficult um, for us even to see them. Um, so if we could go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, most co-op accounting is based on the for-profit format. Some co-ops um, choose to use the not-for-profit, but that's all, that's the choice that they've got. They can have for-profit or not-for-profit. Um, the for-profit measures success by financial return on financial best investment expressed as profit or increase in share value. And it's not really relevant um, for, um, for co-ops. We prioritise financial investment over other forms of contribution, such as participation, um, and members in, um, in the for-profit way of um, accounting are shareholders. They're seen solely as financial investors. But members of co-ops aren't just financial investors, they're participating members of the co-op. They're not altruistic either. They're not putting other people's needs before their own. They recognise that their own needs are mingled with other people's. Um, they're members of the community within which the co-op operates and they can manage both, um, you know, both roles. Um, co-ops don't see the member benefit as um, opposed to wider community benefit. It's a completely different way of looking at, um, at business to the investor oriented way. Um, and the next slide, please. If we think about the statement definition, um, co-ops should really be reporting um, on how they have addressed the economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations. So, um, and I think needs and aspirations, it's, it's really important to remember that that's what co-ops um, are doing. Um, and they should be able to report to their members, the primary users, on how they've done that. Um, Investor-oriented um, reporting standards, the international financial reporting standards that um, Elizabeth's spoken of, um, talk about um, the needs of, uh, of uh, shareholders, really, investors, to have um, information um, about companies, about entities. Um, and they recognize that that reporting should address the needs of both existing um, investors and potential investors. Um, and so we're thinking that co-op co reports should address existing and potential co-op members. So it's wider than just looking at the existing members of the co-op. They need to reflect the particular types of co-op and what's material to that particular co-op. And it's quite difficult because there are so many different forms, you know, the four different uh, sorts that the ILO recognises across many different, across all sectors. Um, but we need to be able to sort of think about the way that financial resources have been used in that context. Um, and a sort that thinks about um, the wider public, the potential um, members could also maybe um, help um, articulate um, the, uh, the cooperative purpose and improve public understanding, both of how important co-ops are, but also the scale of cooperative operation. And the next slide, please. So specific problems for um, financial um, reporting. Um, the, it seemed we, we had a discussion yesterday with our little SORP committee and um, we were, dis, were talking about the problem that equity and liabilities, that, um, that ownership and commitment outside of the organization um, has um, for uh, financial reporting for um, cooperatives particularly because 
Um, Co-ops don't ask for a massive financial investment from members. Um, members contribute to the co-op through their financial investment, yes, but through their participation. Um, they sometimes can withdraw their equity, and if equity is withdrawable under the current way of um, reporting, um, it's, um, it's seen as a liability. This means that um, co-ops are seen as financially fragile, um, because some of their um, capital can um, be withdrawn. Um, it undermines the co-op's ownership base. It undermines the, um, the way that we see members committing to the co-op. Um, and I think this is a massively important one. It separates the co-op as an entity from part of its membership. If you look at um, withdrawable capital as being a liability, that sort of looks at the people who might be withdrawing thank you, that looks at people who might be withdrawing um, their um, equity as separate. Um, it's difficult to sort of see the difference between um, liabilities to non-members and to members. Um, so it's hard to understand the nature of the co-op. The next slide. Um, this, this follows um, the, the, the problems that um, that co-ops have talking about sort of distributions um, to members follow from that sort of uh, definition of um, of uh, equity and um, liabilities which seems to be the sort of the, the thing on which uh, it turns um, so there's a list of of diff of um, of uh, things that we've thought about that might be um, problems um, and another one being on the other side, sort of the, the distribution to members, the idea of, um, of how do we classify their financial um, contributions, but also how do we classify contributions other than financial? Um, things like sweat equity, when people, um, when people volunteer um, for the co-op. So um, there's, a, there's a list of, of um, possible problems um, that we have with, um, with financial reporting on the for-profit um, format, but we would really, really like people to think about um, what we might want to um, see us all look like um, and get in touch with us and, um, and contribute to the project if possible, please. And I'll hand over to Daphne to talk about how the non-financial reporting um, could align with um, the principles and the SDGs. Yes, so we recognize that the first priority is going to be on the financial reporting, but we also uh, can see there's certainly opportunities for cooperatives to improve their non-financial reporting, uh, specifically with the seven principles. Uh, from my own research, I've certainly identified um, you know, a lack of alignment with the uh, seven principles and uh, you know, to me, it, it's important uh, because, uh, you know, our cooperatives are really not sufficiently demonstrating their cooperative difference relative to other business structures. And uh, next slide, please. So uh, we would like to see more uptake of reporting uh, on uh, the seven principles through key performance indicators. And through my research, I've certainly seen that many cooperatives and credit unions are already doing lots of great work that contribute to society, uh, but they, and in many cases, their indicators do reflect and can be correlated to the seven principles, but they're just not presenting them in that fashion. And uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work on this in Canada. We've had a pilot study involving uh, uh, cooperatives in a wide variety of industries across Canada, uh, come up with what uh, they see are, up, we have 35 measures that they've identified that reflect the seven principles. So if cooperatives in the UK wanted to start working on this, they're not starting from scratch. They can uh, build uh, from the work we have already done in Canada. Next slide. 
So in addition to the seven principles, um, we've also identified a lack of uh, broad adoption by cooperatives uh, in their non-financial reporting that reflects the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, again, it matters because, uh, you know, I think it could be argued that cooperatives should probably be leading the way in adopting SDGs, uh, particularly those that are relevant for their particular industrial sectors. And next slide. Uh, so again, uh, we've already started doing some work on this in, in Canada. And uh, we've uh, selected uh, with uh, our participant uh, cooperatives uh, 25 metrics that reflect uh, the 17 SDGs. And um, again, this could possibly be a starting point for cooperatives in the UK if they wanted to take a similar approach and build on what we have done. And next slide. So we thank you for uh, listening to our uh, presentation and our contact information is there if you uh, would like to get in touch with us about the project. So I guess we'll open it up to questions. Right, just to, um, in the q and if, if everybody if I don't know if you everybody realizes you've got a reactions button at the bottom of the screen if you click on the reaction buttons you should see an option to raise your hand and then I I as the the host can see who's raised their hand and, and can give you the chance to ask your question so um, let's see if there's anyone who has, wants to start that process so sooner would you like to uh... Yeah, thanks. I hope you hear me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, interesting initiative. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask, firstly, how would you, how do you relate to the um, uh, the initiative to the existing uh, impact measurement systems such as SROE or uh, uh, economy of common good and like other ways of measuring the non-economic impacts of, uh, of enterprises? And uh, the other question, if I understand right, like you are not intending to replace the financial accounting system, which is still the, let's say, last control instance of uh, all enterprises, but you would like to extend it and replace it for cooperatives. I mean, not replace, but extend it. Who, who wants to answer that? Maureen? Yeah, um, I'll answer the second bit if that's if that's okay about the, um, the financial system. So, um, Yes, it, it is actually replacing um, the way um, that it's done at the moment, but not necessarily by uh, sort of blowing up um, the system that, that's being used, but by sort of moving it into a different um, into a different form, which actually was done in the UK um, in the um, 1990s um, for charities, for not-for-profit organisations, um, and uh, a way of accounting was brought in, which actually embodied a completely different worldview to um, investor oriented um, accounting. Um, and so the sort of idea is maybe we can do the same for co-ops sort of quietly under the IFRS radar. So they don't necessarily <laughs> notice that that's what we're doing. But then you've got a, a, a way of accounting for a different way of, um, of doing business. And, the, and I can probably um, answer, you You mentioned, uh, you know, other frameworks for measuring non-financial performance. And, you know, we certainly recognize that. And when we uh, worked with our participants, particularly on the SDGs, uh, we definitely uh, drew from those other frameworks. So it certainly informed uh, what we did. Um, while, while other people are thinking of the question that they'd like to ask, if, if I heard correctly, there were 35 metrics that you've been piloting that map against the seven cooperative principles. And there yes, are and some of them also correlate with uh, the SDGs uh, as well. So when well, we that's started... what I was wondering. So the 20, oh, yeah. there are 25 that map against the SDGs. How much overlap is there between the 35 and the 25? 
Yeah. Uh, there is some, I can't recall the exact number because we're still in the midst of uh, finalizing it, but uh, there is some overlap. Uh, we do cover off it, within the SDGs, we cover off quite a bit of the seven principles as well. Okay. Right. Um, Suna, your hand is still up. Does that mean you want to carry on the conversation? Right. Okay. So is there anyone else who would like to write? Maureen. I'm sorry. I just, um, I just remembered something that I should have said whilst um, I was presenting that um, uh, though there's a paper that we've written, the three of us with, um, with Ian, who has popped up again. Hello, Ian. Um, um, on this, um, on this topic, the need for, um, the need for, a different format for um, financial reporting, and that's going to come out in the UK SCS uh, journal quite soon. Yes, it's going sure to come out in a standard, a standard edition of the journal. Uh, we we didn't quite have enough for a special conference issue, so it's going to go into one of the, uh, I think, the winter edition of this year. So it, it goes into sort of much more detail. Yeah. Right. Anyone else? Uh, other accountants here. Uh, I can see Darren as an accountant. Who else is an accountant? Gillian and Nick. So Gillian first and Nick. Very much not an accountant. Um, my, my thinking as you were saying it is, um, is there a way that this can be used to engage members as well as um, just on the reporting structure? Because it occurs to me that a lot of demutualization of cooperatives happens when the membership forgets that it's a cooperative and forgets the responsibilities they have to that cooperative and just sort of let it happen. And is there a way that this sort could help members to actually understand what they're part of and avoid that happening? Who would like to answer? Well, certainly from the non-financial reporting piece, uh, having indicators to reflect the seven principles, I think that would be an excellent way to engage members uh, for sure, because a lot of uh, folks at some of the very large uh, cooperatives and credit unions, um, you know, need a little reminding that they're actually a cooperative. So and I'll turn it to Maureen to talk about the SORP, how that might help. Um, I think um, I think it might really help members recognise that they're not an investor-owned um, company. I think um, if you see your results um, being um, presented to you in the same way as um, you know as a large PLC, you can't see that you're different. Um, so uh, I'm not. I, I like to present to my students BAE Systems um, and the National Trust, which is a not-for-profit. Not but um, um, And I also use, actually, an example of, of, um, of a co-op in the middle of them, which, um, which reports under the same format as BAE Systems. You can't see the difference. Um, whereas with the National Trust, which is reporting under the um, charity SORP, um, you can see the difference. You can see that this organization is not doing the same as, um, as the for-profit. So I think, yes, if we had a financial format, which said actually we're um, participation, mutual member benefit and for the wider community, um, it would make an awful lot of difference. Nick? This is a fabulous piece of work. What a, what a trio of, of superstars we've got here. This is absolutely fantastic. Well done. Uh, I think that there's, a, there's two extra tasks we need here. One is to persuade bloody accountants to think differently. Because my experience is when you present these ideas to accountants, they hate new standards full stop because it means they've got to rewrite their accounts. They've got to redraft previous year's accounts. You know, if, you, if you read the co-op groups accounts, it's almost impossible to compare year on year because the accountancy standards keep changing. And what's, you know, what's a cl classified as, a, as an asset one year is a liability the next and all the rest of it. And different parts of the business uh, are clarified, classified in different accountancy standards. So some assets are at net present value, some are at, 
historic value. So you've got no idea whether this asset meets this liability. As a member, you know, you have to have a you have to have lots of fingers for a start off to read all the notes, but you have to have almost a degree in, in uh, accounts to even read the accounts, let alone understand what's, what they're saying. I had hoped um, that the move towards more narrative reporting would help to make um, accounts more transparent to members so that members could see what was meant by you know, the, the various inputs and outputs that the cooperative was generating. Uh, well, I think it's helped a little bit, but I think the overall accounts are still just far too complex for the average member uh, to get the head round. But I, I would also add another point as well, and I think this is a separate issue, but one which I think uh, has got lost in time, is, uh, as Bruno pointed out earlier, uh, back in the day, before the First World War mainly, but up to the 1920s, uh, co-ops were an intrinsic part of the economics curriculum in universities. And cooperatives were a legitimate business model. You know, they were properly studied. Mm -hmm. And the kind of value that was created by cooperatives was measured. Now, I had, I had naively hoped with the introduction of institutional economics, and transaction cost economics, that these cost savings and um, efficiency gains that are produced by cooperation would be monetized and would be measurable and would be able to be transparent to people to demonstrate the economic benefit of cooperation. Because I think at the moment, people who uh, in, the, in the conventional business world, they see the, um, if you like, the costs of association, the costs of having a load of blooming grumpy members that they've got to uh, talk to and be nice to and meet every now and again uh, at, a, at a distance if possible uh, to talk to. Uh, but they can't see the benefits of the cooperative business model in reducing transaction costs and making their business sector more competitive. So uh, my, my you know, it might be a naive hope, but my, my, my fantasy is that by having a clearer uh, definition and clarity of the, of the benefits of cooperation in something like this sort, that will make it easier to sell the concept of a cooperative business model to, uh, if you like, to non-converts, non, non non-cooperators. Can, um, can I interrupt you there and give give the speakers a chance to respond because we've got uh, Please Darren, do, Darren, please Darren, do, I was doing Darren, 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 Darren also wants to ask a question in the moment yeah. so anybody want to respond to uh, Nick's points there just a quick comment um I guess Nick uh, you'd be happy to join our focus groups to pilot the, the recommendations so <laughs> I will invite you personally and I think you're you know you're absolutely right and the, the points are taken and this is one of the discussions we had about the, the SOAP, trying to make it uh, as simple and as accessible as possible to cooperators so it can be useful. And um, I mean, uh, it's a long accounting change. It's a long process. It's not going to happen overnight. And these are small steps we have to take. I wouldn't worry about the accountants because they have to deal with changing standards all the time. And uh, that would be a new market for them, <laughs> I guess. But the, the key issue is how the, 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 the short will be understood and implemented in practice by cooperators. And of course, it needs to um, you know, it, to be relevant to what they're doing, which is another big issue because we're talking about a very diverse sector, the cooperative sector, at different sizes of companies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, accessibility uh, is really important for us. Uh, and absolutely, the financial reporting will have to um, be um, supplemented by narrative and by non-financial information to make sense and really uh, reflect what cooperatives uh, are doing and what the value they're, they're creating. So Darren, do you want to ask your question? And then I'll also ask my question and then uh, one more round of responses. And I think we'll have to start the second paper. So Darren, I'll yeah, ask you. 
Yeah, hi. Um, I guess it's more an observation than a question, but a really interesting uh, development. I guess um, my question really is around the fact that it's been developed in the uh, the SORP in the UK first before obviously more of an international uh, sort further down the line. So it strikes me that you you could do worse than um, uh, cross over to the, the field of management accounting and the chartered institute of management accountants, just for some some advice about the, particularly about the non-finance side of things. So for example, in my world, because I'm a management accountant, you know, with balance scorecards and building block models are kind of been part of our makeup for, for quite a long time. And they'll just have that more of a specialism in things like that distinction between, which is really important for co-ops, is the difference between say a core competency and a critical success factor, for example. So that's two very important distinctions that uh, you would make in terms of non-finance indicators. So really what is the your core competency as a co-op compared to the critical success factors as running as a, as a co-op so I, I would have thought that would be a nice for me that that step over the line to the field of management accounting where you're going to get more of a different perspective that might fit nicely with uh, for you guys as the as the uh, the financial accountant so I, it's not really a question it's more I guess of it might be an idea to consult uh, with uh, with uh, uh, those kind of bodies okay and and my my question is around it's kind of linked to Sonia Novkovich's point last year that there could be sector specific extensions of the principles and values so that there have been extensions in the worker cult world, for example, for the 10 principles of Mondragon. Whether there would be any sector, co-op sector, this is co-op sector specific extensions to the SORP. Um, the, the, the reason I ask is as someone who's interested in extending worker cooperation within the cooperative movement, I would love to know how many workers in a cooperative are also members, irrespective of the type of cooperative they are, but also in worker co-op worlds, because we know that Italian co-ops don't have as many worker members as Mondragon's worker co-ops. Mondragon typically around 80%, Italy down as low as 20% sometimes. So we need to monitor how many staff members are, are members of the co-op. Um, just to understand worker cooperation, but it would be good to know that um, as well in, in other forms of co-op. So that's my question. So let's, let's take the answer for that, for those two, and then we'll move on to the second paper. So who, who, who wants to pick up Darren's and my point? Maureen? Um I think if we could get involvement of um, the uh, professional bodies, it would be quite wonderful. Um, we have sort of tried a little bit with ICAW, but um, uh, <laughs> not really successfully. Um, but you know, if we could get if we could get one of the large firms, um, accounting firms. I know it, it might be um, you know stopping with the devil, but um, but it's worth doing if you can get something. Um, you know, off the ground and um, and to uh, to happen, um, but yeah, ACCA, SEMA, ICAW. Um, I think we need to get all of them on board if we can. Um, and Rory's question, I'm going to leave to somebody else. I, I'm not quite sure how to address it. I think Daphne might know. Did you work on the um, the the worker corporate? cooperative reporting the work cooperative index Daphne so, no I didn't no, no okay but that's an, another yeah issue we're, we're discussing because we would like to leave it as generic as possible and then have the ability to uh, adapt it to the different kind of needs and uh, purposes of different uh, types of cooperatives but these are really yeah important issues that we have to get feedback from the actual practitioners and co cooperatives that uh, will make use of this information. But that's a um, yeah, good point. Okay. All right, I've, um, just to round off, just I've, I mentioned to Steve Gill, he's got a very able and sympathetic accountant working on the Co-op Exchange project. So he's gonna ask Richie if he joined the working group. Uh, here, he, he can plug you into key people in uh, accounting bodies too, I think. Right, so um, the, do we have, 
Mark, is Mark here now? Yes. Hello, Mark. I can see you there. So, Mark, Daphne said that you will be presenting the paper on credit unions response. So I hand over to you. I yeah, we're both presenting, actually. Slide, I'll right? do two slides and then Mark is doing the Mark's bulk gonna, of it. going to lead off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up the presentation and I'll ask Daphne to kick us off and then... Uh, okay. And that'll be that. One second, please. Just got to share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. And I'll go to presentation mode. Okay, Daphne, over to you. Okay. Uh, so the topic of our uh, presentation is talking uh, like a cooperative. If you could move to the next slide. Uh, so the main topics we're going to be talking about is isomorphism. We're talking about how language is how we conceptualize the world. And then we uh, focus in on uh, how cooperatives can frame the debate through their use of language. Next slide. So uh, there, there are several papers um, about uh, you know, isomorphism and cooperatives. Uh, however, uh, the papers tend to focus on uh, how isomorphism focuses on comp competition and culture, uh, but really they haven't uh, discussed language. So that's sort of been left out of the, the research picture. Next slide. So there really is very little research that asks whether cooperate cooperatives communicate in a fashion that's consistent with their form. I've done a little bit of research I mentioned in the last presentation where I found that although uh, in many of the annual reports that I looked at, cooperatives did actually uh, have key performance indicators that it could be correlated with the principles. He didn't present them that way and didn't even mention the principles anywhere, which was kind of disappointing. And in another study um, that I was involved in, we found that, you know, again, cooperatives reported a huge number of key, uh, key performance indicators, but they tend to serve impression management goals and operational demands rather than, you know, reporting on fulfillment uh, of the principles, which is, you know, clearly fundamental to the cooperative movement. Next slide. Uh, so then we looked uh, through the literature and looked at uh, textbooks to see what the coverage was like there. So in one study, uh, they surveyed 17 U.S. and Canadian textbooks and uh, less than half mentioned co-ops and those that did only had about one page on co-ops. However, historically, when you go back uh, to the early 20th century, there was more content in textbooks uh, before World War II. So uh, in this study, it was suggested that it wasn't that there was a declining importance of cooperatives, but uh, there was a change in the focus uh, in the terms of the role of economists as they focused on top-down solutions rather than local and institutionally sensitive ones. And clearly this type of focus put cooperatives at a disadvantage in terms of the profile that they were uh, given in the uh, in textbooks. And next slide, please. Um, as well, when you look at the literature on social economy, uh, initially, uh, when you go back and look at the focus on social enterprises, when that first emerged in the UK, uh, you know, co-ops were important, but then the focus started to shift more towards the voluntary sector and co-ops tend to decline, um, you know, in that type of discourse. And um, in another study of Irish uh, credit unions, um, initially there's community service versus uh, emerging enterprise and emerging enterprises uh, that focused on innovation and competitiveness. So again, there was this movement away from the co-ops and the community focus and the, uh, you know, 
when there were analytical focus uh, on inside the co-op, it was more of an internal discussion as opposed to external facing uh, communication. So uh, by and large, uh, there certainly wasn't, you know, a significant amount of uh, discussion. And one last area, if we can move to the next slide, uh, that uh, we looked at was looking at um, the CSR and sustainability literature. So there was a study by uh, Do Good and Balkan in 2016, where uh, they found when co-ops were reporting on sustainability, there really wasn't a great deal of communication on that, particularly by Canadian uh, cooperatives. Also, it was noted that, uh, you know, the big banks have made substantial CSR contributions. Uh, really, it's co uh, credit unions with their focus on the principle seven that ideally should be at the core of CSR activity. So, you know, we would expect and, you know, would be uh, cooperatives to be reporting more on CSR than they actually are. And um, another study, uh, we found that uh, when co-ops act as socially responsible organizations, it increases their value proposition, not only for their members, but also for the wider community in which they operate. And uh, this is something that uh, is important, but this study, of course, didn't really focus on uh, the public and member facing discourse. So that's a, a brief uh, summary of the literature, uh, the different strands of the literature that we looked at to find some evidence of, uh, you know, uh, talking more about cooperatives. So uh, I'm going to turn the presentation over now to uh, Marc-Andre, who will uh, describe our project in a bit more detail. Thank you, Daphne. Um, so I'm just going to move this slide forward here. Um, so. As Daphne kind of underlined, uh, what we're trying to do with this research is to kind of think or fill what we, we've identified as a gap in the research, which is looking at how cooperatives themselves talk out to their members, out to the public. Do they, do they reference the fact that they're a cooperative? And I think this question, I heard a comment as I came on to the conversation earlier today that a lot of members don't know they're, they're part of a cooperative. Um, and at least part of the blame, we can look to textbooks and education, we can look to government, we can look to media, um, but at least part of the story has to be, are the cooperatives themselves, <laughs> you know, putting up the language uh, of cooperatives? Um, do they use the word cooperative? Do they use the word credit union? Um, these, these may seem like, in, in, this may not seem terribly important at one level, but if you've been involved, like I have with the credit union sector for a long time, um, this debate about whether to use the word credit union in your name is uh, endless and and organizations will fluctuate on how they actually respond to this question. Um, so this is this is kind of the focus for us is do Canadian credit unions and we're looking at Canadian credit unions talk co-op? Do they use concepts and terms and ideas associated with cooperatives um, more than banks? And, and the reason we ask this question relative to banks is because, as Daphne pointed out, um, in Canada, especially, um, I would suggest a lot of the banks themselves have started adopting language of corporate social responsibility. In fact, they have to produce reports to Parliament in Canada that talk about all the work they're doing with communities. Um, and so there's a kind of policy push and a kind of societal push for them to adopt language that you would normally have associated with cooperatives. And so the kind of interesting question for us is, are credit unions actually using this discourse more than banks or do we see the banks kind of shifting into this space and taking up more of that, that rhetorical space at least for that perspective. Um, and that's, that's, that kind of leads to our second question. Um, so the first question is, do they use language that's consistent with their form? Does their form inform the language they use? And then the second question is, and this is relating more to that evolving, changing language, um, is can replace the credit unions on a continuum between bank talk and credit union talk and can replace banks on the continuum between credit union and bank talk. Um, so can we get some kind of measures that kind of substantiate our intuition around some of this stuff? Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're going with this. And 
Um, and, and this relates back, of course, to the isomorphism question, even the demutualization question, because if you're not thinking and framing the world and communicating in, those, in the terms that are associated with your form, um, that could be an early warning signal of, of problems to come. So um, how, do we, how do we approach this? How do we answer these questions? Um, and, and the way we kind of begin this is, is to kind of theorize a little bit and do a little bit of methodology. I, I see a spelling error in my, in my title, <laughs> apologies for that. Uh, but the, the premise is that the organizational form should at least shape the language used. So if you start at that bolded, um, just above the green arrow, the organizational form, whether it's investor owned or cooperative, should shape the language used by that organization, which in turn should, should influence broader societal discourse and accentuate the relevance of that form, right? So the more you talk about shareholders, if you're a bank, the more that kind of generates a shareholder mentality, which then just kind of anchors that, that organizational form in policymaking and in the way we address our collective needs um, as a society. And, and for this research, we're really just focusing on this top part of, the, of that, that kind of causal structure um, and looking at how the form shapes the discourse. Um, and as I said here below, you know, if cooperatives and credit unions don't talk about themselves as cooperatives and credit unions, who will? And what does that imply for the isomorphism perspective? So this is just a kind of restatement of what I already um, said. So that's that's kind of the big picture perspective on how we're we're going about this. And let's look, drill down a little bit and see how we're going to do this in terms of methods. Um, so for methods, I, I, I'm really looking and we're really looking to this political science literature and this text as data literature. This is computational linguistics, another way of describing some of this. Um, and this literature has kind of arisen because political scientists ask questions that are very, you can analogize or very closely to what I've just, the questions we're asking here. In other words, they'll look at a, a political party that, that frames itself as say socialist uh, or another political party that frames itself as, I don't know, conservative. And then they'll ask, you know, do the party platforms, do the, does the language of the leadership does it align with what we understand to be a kind of socialist kind of agenda or a conservative agenda or a centrist agenda? And they'll, they've been asking themselves these kinds of questions for, for decades, right? And, and they've uh, done a lot of work and a lot of thinking about how you can measure whether or not a political party or a political leader kind of fits what you might expect their organizational form to put them in the box of. So, um, the, one of the biggest projects out there the, I'm drawing, we're drawing some inspiration from is this um, comparative manifesto project. Some of you may be familiar with this, uh, but it's a massive project that analyzes um, party platforms from every democratic country in the, every, in the, in the world um, and encodes them for uh, a, a range of kind of issues um, and on a liberal to illiberal kind of spectrum. Um, and and this, this project, this work, you can go and look at it online, um, is used by everybody from, you know, economists to sociologists to psychologists. Everyone's kind of using these for, for statistical analysis or for other kinds of analysis. Um, so this is a good inspirational kind of source for us to think about addressing our question. Another approach that, and, and I've put some references here that you could follow up on if you're interested. Uh, the other approach that we're, we're using or in being inspired from is kind of dictionary approaches to analysis. analysis. Um, and again, <clears throat> in the political science literature, you'll see this a lot, um, maybe less so nowadays, but uh, certainly historically, where, where researchers would say, well, here are some of the terms and the concepts that, we, that, that historically we know are strongly associated with a kind of liberal perspective on issues and versus an illiberal perspective on issues. And, and over time, people have developed dictionaries of concepts and terms that are really strongly associated with these different perspectives. And then you can do some really interesting kind of analysis of, of, uh, of party speeches and whatnot. So Mertz and Schneider did this for hundreds of um, speeches and they can, you can in a very automated way and a very efficient way code speeches and you can immediately find that you know the speech from the North Korean leader has a lot of illiberal themes <laughs> you know just the dictionary will tell you that without you having to actually read the text and then if you validate that with a human coding um, it's very clear that your, your dictionary is 
actually doing a good job of classifying leaders on this kind of liberal and liberal spectrum. Um, and so, and you can also, the interesting thing about all of these is you can trace shifting positions. And that's kind of part of our interest here is you can see how an organization or a ideology shifts over time. So uh, I guess in the, in the UK, you would have the Labour Party, which used to be pretty, pretty uh, left of center, you know, with Tony Blair and, uh, and then the kind of new liberal perspective coming in, you, you see, you can actually see the language shifting as they move more and more to the center. And so the, the analogy is, do you see credit unions shifting from, from here, maybe more cooperatively oriented to more, you know, bank oriented, or do you see banks shifting from here, you know, pure shareholder speak to something that starts looking more like a cooperative speak. <clears throat> and so that's, that's another method that we can draw inspiration from. And then a third one is machine language approaches, which is um, really neat stuff. And I don't claim to master um, yet, but I'm working on it. Um, <clears throat> you can do some really kind of fun uh, automated um, work to kind of model topics and themes that emerge in taught in texts um, and this is this stuff is if you use google you're using machine learning uh, approaches right so you you can assess whether this stuff works or not um, it's pretty darn good <laughs> it's pretty darn good uh, you don't take the human out of this but this machine lear learning stuff um, is actually it's a little disappointing to the human in me, but it's pretty darn good at, at figuring out what the themes are out there. So these are these are the approaches that are informing uh, the way we're going to approach our study. And just to kind of give you a sense of these these methods on a spectrum of uh, deductive versus inductive, um, because we're we're going to start with the dictionary approach in this work, um, and then we're going to start bringing in these more um, uh, machine language approaches. So the deductive approach is where you know, Daphne and I, for example, and this is what happened, and I'll tell you a bit more about this in a minute, we sit down and we say, okay, when we think cooperative, what do we think? What are the terms and the concepts that we associate with cooperatives? And then we kind of put those down. That's a deductive approach. We have this kind of expert knowledge that will inform the way we go in with our a priori assumptions about what the language will look like. Whereas the machine language approach, the other end of the spectrum at the bottom of this chart, uh, is more inductive. It takes the text as given, and then it it pulls out meaning, it pulls out concepts. Um, and, and you can use these two approaches to validate each other. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and I won't get any more into this chart than I have for you, than I just said, but it's a super interesting chart. And it's not mine, by the way. Um, this is somebody else's and I'm blanking on the author's name, but I just wanna make sure you understand that's not, I didn't come up with this. Um, so our blended approach is first, we develop a conceptual dictionary that we think has broad applicability beyond credit unions, although the focus point of our analysis is on credit unions. Uh, then we, we develop a code book. This is like the comparative manifesto project a little bit, where we want to start human coding texts to kind of validate our dictionary approach, and they can inform each other. In fact, that's the process we've been involved in for the last few months, is that kind of cross fertilization. And then the final pro part of the process uh, is a further validity check um, is to kind of use some, some of these machine language approaches to kind of really feel good about our dictionary. Um, I should say dictionary development is, and I, I think I mentioned this, but it is a very long and fraught process. And you know, put words in, you take words out, you're constantly iterating. Um, and you know, some of the dictionaries that are used out there have been through many, many versions. Um, so we're, we're just starting out, but I think we're, we're gonna have some good, good results and I'll show you some in a minute. Um, a caution, all quantitative models of language are wrong, but some are useful. And, and the useful thing here is that we can, we can process a lot of documents efficiently without having to read them in excruciating detail and having a lot of money to hire human coders. That's, that's part of the logic of, of going down this road of dictionary analysis and eventually machine language. Um, the coding work that we're developing is, is more from a validity perspective. Um, and I'll, I'll show you exactly what the usefulness uh, looks like in a minute. Um, but that's that's the that's the logic of a lot of this stuff. It's not saying that computers are going to have the same depth of understanding as a human, a skilled human reader, um, but they can get us a long way, and they can help a skilled human reader um, develop new insights uh, that they wouldn't have otherwise had. So, so here's how we've done it. We started with this idea of creating a dictionary and then a code book. Um, we create this dictionary of a priori terms. So Daphne and I kind of collaborated on this. 
And then we tried to validate with an external community of, of co-op experts in Canada. We got a survey response rate. Of, we got 35 people responding. We had about uh, maybe 60 or so people that we invited. Um, and this was just where we'd lay out our terms and we'd say, which, which, which organizational form do you associate this term with? And then they could choose co-op, uh, investor-owned firm, or both. And then we would retain terms, we retain terms that had a strong degree of support uh, in the co-op bucket or the IOF bucket. And that's how we started validating some of our dictionary. And we also asked people to submit ideas that we may have forgotten or missed um, into our uh, proposed basket of terms for the dictionary. We also then developed, and this is only in the last few weeks, so this is all very fresh. Um, we started developing a code book drawing strong inspiration from the Comparative Manifesto project. Uh, we applied, um, and this is only in the last week or so, we've applied some, some of the code book to a random selection of, of our annual report text, and I'll explain my data, the data source in a minute. Uh, but we got an anonymized set of texts uh, and we started coding those. Uh, and this is a, a process where we're going to refine the code book, refine the dictionary, refine the code book, refine the dictionary. Um, and then the idea is that eventually what we're going to produce is going to be usable by people outside of the narrow context that we're applying. So you could use it in retail cooperatives or your cooperatives writ large, right, um, in, in your country or in a region or, or whatever. Um, but that's the that's kind of where we want to go in our contribution, hopefully, uh, to the discussion. Um, so here's here's some of the concepts and categories that have emerged so far for our dictionary um, and our code book. And the key thing is the entity structure orients it to use language in these areas. So the patron group, who's the dominant patron group? I mean, some of this is really obvious, right? A bank or investor-owned firm is going to be their shareholder, and credit union is going to be the member, and so on, right? But the uh, you know that's some of this is obvious, some of this is less obvious. What is it, what does the structure say about its economic objectives and its orientation towards economic objectives? And what's the language we associate with that? Geographic focus, you know, local versus national. In this case, credit unions versus banks, local versus national, or local versus international. In some cases. Who are the stakeholders it orients itself to? Um, we can kind of distinguish between credit unions and banks there too. Governance, time horizon, short term, long term would be the key distinction there, banks versus credit unions. How does it self-identify? This is back to the question of, does it say it's a cooperative? Does it say it's a credit union? The banks have no compunction about describing themselves as banks. <laughs> you'll, you'll see in a minute, uh, in Canada anyway, uh, but credit unions are, remarkably reluctant to use the language. And if they're, again, if they're not using the language, it becomes this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where, uh, well, no one knows what a credit union is, so we're not gonna use the word credit union. And of course, if you don't use it, no one will know, right? So there's this kind of, people get into this logic and organizations get in this logic. And it's partly because I think they're not thinking about their power to structure the debate. Um, and then purpose, of course, is, is a real important part of this as well. Um, and we can distinguish between that and credit unions and banks along that, that, that line of thinking too. So that's, that's how we've organized the dictionary. And I'll show you a sample uh, of some of these terms. And these map to the code book. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be coding by word. You'd be coding by concept within a sentence. So they're called quasi-sentences. Uh, but, you know, so there's patron group. These are the terms we associate with cooperatives. These are the terms we associate with banks. Economics, here's some of the concepts that we've kind of validated so far anyway um, for credit union or cooperatives versus banks, all the way down, right? So geography, um, some of these are really powerful, like governance um, is a powerful one that distinguishes co-ops and banks or credit unions and banks. And, and we'll see evidence of this in some of the findings as well. Um, the, I'll just draw one your attention to one other thing, geography, if you look at community, the asterisk here just means that we're going to catch words like community, communities, any variation on community will be pulled up and counted by our dictionary um, software. Um, and, and this is a concept that's, that's actually really powerful in Canada for credit unions that differentiates them from banks. Um, and we can kind of infer right away that they're on a, a more credit union side of the, of the spectrum. 
So some of the data that we're using, um, this is uh, beginning phases, but we'd like to ambitiously start collecting in reports, you know, annually. And you look at the CEO and chair statements. These are the most analogous, analogous to uh, a, a leader's kind of statement uh, or party platform. This is where you, the organization says who they are, what they are, why they are, et cetera. This is not the management discussion analysis section of the annual report, which is very, as you know better than I do, very structured and very kind of, you know, formatted. There's not a lot of flexibility. This is where you get to be who you are <laughs> as an organization. Um, and so this is the kind of place we can play and um, that I think makes sense. Um, we surveyed uh, the 85, we actually surveyed the 100 largest credit unions, uh, but 15 of them didn't have annual reports that we could actually get online. So uh, we ended up with 85. That accounts for well over 90% of all the credit union assets in Canada. Um, the documents range from 319 words to 14,000 words, so a vast range. We need to go through this and make sure these, um, we had a student pull these things and when I'm not always, I'm not sure they always cut the line at the right place. So we need to validate that. Uh, but it does give you a sense that bigger organizations like Coast Capital, which is the second biggest credit union in Canada, um, talk more than smaller organizations like First Credit Union uh, in British Columbia, a very small credit union. Um, and if you look at the banks, uh, so we had the top 10 banks as part of our sample. So we have 85 credit unions, 10 banks. Um, you can see that, uh, again, there's this kind of correlation between size and word count in these statements. ATB Financial is a small bank, province focused in Alberta, focused in the province of Alberta. TD Bank is a global bank. <laughs> so the word counts are dramatically different. Again, we need to validate some of this and make sure the student cut the lines but I'm, I'm pretty confident that size correlates to word count. Um, and uh, we'll see a little bit of evidence of that in a minute. Um, okay, so here's, here's, some, here's a shot that kind of, here's a, a, a quick poll. This is more from the inferential side. What are the words, the top words that, that are being used by credit unions versus banks? And uh, so members, okay, members, this shouldn't be surprising. And it's a good outcome. It's a good. It's a kind of an interesting finding that credit unions are using the word members a lot, way way more than banks. And banks are using the word bank a lot. I should say something about the word bank in Canada. In Canada, bank is a good thing. <laughs> you know, our banking system is very stable, no major failures for for decades. Um, so the banks like to tout the fact that they're banks. Um, and and in fact, credit unions use the word bank a lot, partly to play on that um, on that. Uh, on that credibility. In fact, they were taken to task by the federal regulator for using the word bank too much. They had no evidence that they were using the bank too much. This work that we're doing now actually could have really contributed to that policy debate. Uh, but well, the well, banks well, were concerned about that. Yep. Just to let you know, you've got about 15 minutes left and that, that includes the Q&A time. Okay, okay, I'm cranking to the end here. Thank you very much. I, I was worried about time and I'd lost the lost that track. So just this is just a very quick kind of picture. Um, the, I draw your attention to community. It's another word. Credit union is actually used quite a bit proportionally um, and so on. So that's, this is some of the, some of the inferential data. Uh, this familiar word clouds. <laughs> um, again, words like members and community uh, really pop out here. Um, this is what's called keyword in context where I pick a word, a key concept, and I look at 20 words on either side, and then I do a word cloud based on that sample. Um, and this is this is the fun stuff. I guess this is the end of my, or pretty much the end of my presentation. This is where I can actually start classifying organizations on this spectrum of <clears throat> credit union versus bank. And what's nice about our dictionary, and this is from our dictionary, is that it's actually doing a good job of classifying banks as banks. They're all to the right of that zero line and credit unions as to the left as credit unions. And this is a, I call this the sentiment index. This is drawing on the literature, but it's a way of scoring an organization on a scale of some kind of a, of a type. And I didn't have, I haven't had time to explain it, but you can see that um, as you go closer to the banks, uh, those credit unions that are closer to the banks generally are bigger credit unions. As you get further away from the banks, you're generally in the smaller credit union space. So that's one of the, I'd say, interesting findings, early findings from this work. Is that you know, and maybe not surprising, but the smaller organizations tend to talk more co-op. Bigger organizations tend to talk less co-op. Um, and some banks, like ATB, which I can't point to here, but um, it's just a little bit up from the bottom, 
um, they talk a lot like co-ops. <laughs> so there's this kind of interesting finding. And that's not surprising because they're a weird bank. They're owned by the province of Alberta. So they're a bit of a government entity. So they look and talk a little bit more like a co-op. So that's that's the that's where we're at. Uh, our, our work really is to validate a lot of our data, go through it, make sure it's as clean as it can be, uh, validate our dictionary, uh, validate our scoring. This chart I just showed you, validate the themes. There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of validation work that needs to be happening, but also expand the sample so that we can review not just tens but hundreds of documents and get a more robust um, analysis. And that's the benefit of this kind of more inferential learning. So thank you very much. I'm happy for, uh, we're happy for questions. Okay, that, I found that absolutely fascinating. I, I, I um, it reminds me of other very large scale qualitative research studies that have, have been done on, on the social economy in, in uh, the UK and Europe. So um, who would like to kick off the querying or the questioning? Let's give you a couple of moments to gather your thoughts. Gillian. I think mine's more of a, a comment than a question. Yeah. And I was really intrigued by the list of words. I love that analysis of words. It's, um, it's wonderful. But the, the fact that the credit unions mentioned employees and employee, but the banks didn't. I find that quite intriguing. Um, I have no idea why they wouldn't, but it, it's an interesting cooperative way of looking at things to talk about the employees. So I was really intrigued by that. I don't know if you've got any um, comments on why. Yeah, I think I think one one thing I would observe is that in the membership group, the people that show up to the annual annual meetings are are often the employees uh so there's this kind of there's perhaps some of that going on in fact the employees are the people who vote for the board for the most part um mm -hmm. credit unions have become a bit like worker-owned cooperatives in a sense uh, because the broader membership doesn't get involved uh, for the most part um so there's there's some of that I think, you know, one thing I didn't mention that Daphne and I we kicked this project off thinking in the context of COVID-19 uh, and, and whether credit unions and banks were communicating differently in that context. And so it is interesting to observe that credit unions seem to be putting more weight on how their employees are faring in that crisis um, than banks. And, and I think some of that just falls back on that stakeholder orientation or that patron orientation. Should banks are oriented towards their shareholders we generated this return. Yeah, maybe we looked after our employees a little bit, but we generated this return, <laughs> you know, and by the way, our employees can't change our directors. They can't vote for our board in any real effective way. But in a credit union, it's very different. Your, your credibility hinges on your relationship with your employees. Your local roots are in some sense built off the basis of your employees. The employees vote for your board. I, I, I'm guessing some of that's going on, but you know, that's work we have to kind of dig into a little bit, but it's a really good point. And I've, I've wrestled with that because I would have assumed the banks would communicate more forcefully about their employees, but they haven't, at least from early evidence. That's just um, raised with me that I've had several contacts from my credit union um, throughout the pandemic, very supportive um, right. in a much bigger way than, they, than the bank that I'm involved with does. So that, that's got me intrigued. I shall start looking at what they're saying now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Anna. <clears throat> Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think it's uh, very interesting that the smaller entities, smaller cooperatives are using uh, more of this language and the bigger it gets, uh, they use more bank language. And uh, since I'm working more with the um, very small initiatives, more kind of emerging uh, startups. Um, I think it, it would be really interesting to also see the sort of historical perspective. Uh, does the language of one organization changes uh, as they grow? Mm -hmm. um, of course, that's probably um, out of your scope, but just as a personal interest, um, yeah, I think that would be interesting. Or the small organizations uh, as they become maybe more uh, sustainable in terms of organization, keep this language. 
Thank you. Daphne, do you want to jump in? I, I, I hogged that last question, so I want to make sure you uh, you jump in. That's OK. You go ahead. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's a super interesting question. In fact, I'm doing a presentation to a board next week of one of the big credit unions that was in my in that chart. Uh, and I've been thinking about doing exactly that, pulling their maybe the last 15 years of their annual reports and just seeing how that conversation has evolved and that we can do that and I can score it and say, you know what, you were talking more co-op in 2008 than you are today or, you know, and, and then that's a really interesting reflection for the board to think about how their management is engaging with their membership when they write their annual report or when they're communicating on the website. So it, it the, the, the exciting thing for, for us about this research is it opens up a million questions um, that, and a million applications of this method and these tools and that we want people to use. So please keep it, keep it coming, <laughs> those kinds of questions. Um, Suna? Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking, um, like you had this, uh, like at the very beginning, like the theoretical base, but you, with this kind of causality or like that, the, the um, language should reflect the organizational form and the position of the uh, relation of the organization to the values. So how would you relate, uh, how, what would you, yeah, how do those organizations relate to your study who really live up and communicate cooperative values without being cooperatives and organizational form? Well, that's, I mean, it's also beyond your, uh, your study, but just was thinking yeah. about that. Yeah, well, that's that's the interesting thing. I mean, in a sense, from a theoretical perspective, I guess we would all assume, and I think the work that Daphne has been doing elsewhere on, on the reporting, we would all assume that the form is going to shape behavior. Um, but if it's if it's and that's what that model is saying, basically, we're going to take that assumption and test it. And it, but if they're not, or if they're, then that's interesting. I think for for researchers to kind of explore what's going on there. Is there broader societal forces or the regulators driving something? What's What's happening, and this is the isomorphism question ultimately, I think, are you seeing some sort of coercive isomorphism from regulators, in this case, forcing uh, banks to talk more like credit unions? Uh, because the history, and if you read Hansman, um, he talks a lot about this, of government compelling private investor-owned firms to behave. <laughs> and then this starts crowding out the cooperatives who were behaving, right? And so there's a, you can kind of see a little bit of evidence of this in some of the the language reflection as well. So there's that kind of coercive isomorphism. There's the normative isomorphism where all these people coming through business programs now have to take an ethics class and they have to take a, a corporate social responsibility module, or I don't know, but they're, they're starting to, that, that way of thinking is starting to percolate up into language, you know? And so, and then there's the kind of uh, uh, mimetic isomorphism, you're just, copying what the other guys are doing. So um, I think, you know, that, that to me is, this is directly related to that isomorphism question. Um, yeah. You yeah. expect one thing, but you're seeing something else. If I could add to that, one thing that I've observed from my uh, studies when I've interviewed C, uh, CEOs and CFOs about why they're reporting what they're reporting, uh, you know, the bulk of them have actually been uh, their previous employment uh, had been senior positions with the Canada's big banks. So they come from the banking sector and they're bringing that perspective with them. And in fact, one, he'd been a CEO for 15 years of the, uh, of the credit union. He didn't even know what the principles were. So I think that's a sad commentary, you know, but I think they're obviously brought into the credit unions uh, for their financial expertise, and that's certainly important, but they don't seem to get a good grounding um, into what the cooperative model actually is. So I think that's part of the issue as well. I'll let Nick go first. Nick? Caught me out. I was listening to that discussion. I thought it was very, very interesting. <laughs> Um, I think that the, I, I think this is a really interesting piece of work, and I commend you on on on, on, on setting out to do it and putting that fantastic fantastic sort of lexicon together about language. This reminds me a great deal of Raymond Williams' work uh, on the way the words and language changes over words change over time. And I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that work, but it seems to me there's two issues here that I think we. We, we, as cooperators, we should take deep cognizance of. 
One is that this is changes in language to me. Sound like an early warning system to demutualization. If the language starts to change, you think, uh oh, who are they talking to? They're talking to potential investors or are they talking to members? That, that's a very interesting observation. And then the other thing that occurred to me, is the language a reflection of the behavior or does it determine the behavior? Is it, is it, is it cause or is it effect? And I'm, I'm not quite sure of that, but I was reminded, <clears throat> I was reminded of a, a story about H.G. Wells and Sidney Webb, if you'll pardon me, uh, going down a, a slight tangent. Uh, Wells asked Webb, he says, how is this socialism going to come about? He says, we're going to put socialists into key positions in organisations and in, in the government and places like this, uh, and they're going to permeate it, uh, permeate those institutions, and they'll become socialist. And Wells sort of stroked his chin and says, yes, Sydney, of course they will like a mouse permeates a cat. So I think with <laughs> Daphne's point about the dominant ideology of the investor-owned corporation, right. if you're not careful, you've got to create this um, dynamic subculture. We, we, now let's face it, we're a minority, but if it's not a dynamic and exciting subculture, it'll just completely get swallowed up by the dominant culture. So you need to create that quirkiness and not be afraid of being different. And I think that's quite diff difficult for conservative bankers and finances to think of themselves being quirky or wacky or thinking slightly outside in the marketing right. space, you know. How can I present right. myself as being groovy? You know, that's not something that bankers normally think about, is it? Given the time, Nick, I'll, I'll piggyback on, on, on you with a, a further comment and then give our two speakers a chance to respond. Um, I was thinking on the methodological question, I think it was uh, Suna who made this point, you know, is are they just sort of writing their annual reports to satisfy, you know, those people who are watching? You could compare the language if you can obtain business plans from internally where the audience is internal rather than external and see whether um, the language is consistent across both documents. That would give you some insight as to whether they're, they're being consistent across two, more than one document. Um, and just by way of a, a, a comment about the, I think it was Gillian, whether they use employees or not. Um, it's a long time ago, I, during my PhD, I went to the ICAEW to listen to a debate on governance. And I was struck during that debate um, that employees just don't exist for them um, in their conversation. And it was so striking that I asked a question, you know, about would Marconi have uh, gone through um, its collapse if employees had been involved in governance? And the reaction to that in the room was quite striking and striking enough for me to write a section about it in the PhD itself. Um, so it, it, there is there is something about, you know, the language shaping what you think about um, and whether employees are in the frame or not in the frame, I think actually is quite relevant, you know, whether because uh, if you because you've asked that kind of thing at co-op congress or you know with consumer co-ops they might say oh yeah well we have a few employees on the board you know maybe we have one maybe we limit it to three you know but the, the point is it would be within the lexicon of a co-op board to have some employee members on the board yeah albeit in their consumer role right so let's have uh, reactions to you both and then i think we'll have to close the day sure Daphne, do you want to start no, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe I'll work backwards. I mean, I think the employee thing is just endlessly fascinating. And, and when we were doing the dictionary, it was some, one of those things where we wrestled a little bit with it. Uh, I think um, in the credit union space, I can say this about Canada. It's not that the employees have representatives on the board. It's that they, they're they the only ones who are voting. <laughs> you know, so they, they're in a... so. It's, it's a strange thing, um, and I think it's something we'll have to just dig into a little more to understand, um, but I, I'm, I'm glad you, you folks picked up on that. Um, on the, um, I think the, uh, the question, I, I love the story about Sidney Webb and H.G. Wells. I, I won't soon forget the, the mouse and the, and the cat, um, but the, uh, the, the question around um, reflecting behavior or is it causing behavior is, is, is kind of an eternal question um, in social science and, and language studies, but I think it's both, you know, frankly. I mean, that's kind of what um, we're getting at. But you would expect 
a little bit anyway, because I've worked in government and there you do really feel the power of the structure shaping your language. There's certain words. I had a friend, I'll just tell a little story. I had a good friend who was a bureaucrat. He would try to, he would feel great victories when he would sneak in a word that was unusual into a briefing note, right? And, oh, I got that by them, <laughs> you know, but that just, just to show you the power of a structure to potentially shape the language of, a, of, an organ, of, the, of the people in that organization. So, I, you know, to me, it's still an interesting question. I still think that, at least from this research perspective, we're asking the structure shaping behavior question rather than the behavior shaping structure question. But um, I think it goes both ways. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. So, thank you everyone um, today. I, I just, Grant's just put something, there are no employee members in a consumer co-op. Um, I was just about to write back, that is true, but there can be people who are employees on the board of a consumer co-op because they allow employees to be on the board in their consumer role. Um, and it really, there is a difference between different consumer co-ops as to how, the, how much, uh, how positive they are about that. Um, so thank you very much. That was an absolutely fascinating paper. And uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that SORP work really does look like it's moved on in the last 12 months compared to um, the previous conversation. And, and it'd be great if we could come back next year and hear what the working group has recommended by way of a SORP standard for co-op. So I hope we'll see you again. Um, so thank you to everyone. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now.